Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Christoph. I'm from ScaleUp uh, in Germany, and this is Frank. And Hello. We are here today to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, how we how we built our OpenStack-based cloud um, at ScaleUp and um, what we do to keep it running, um, and all of that um, from a perspective of being a rather small company and doing it with a, a very small team. So um, uh, to give you a rough overview of the agenda, so I'll, I'll talk briefly about uh, our team uh, here at ScaleUp, uh, uh, the, the ScaleUp story, how we get, uh, how we actually got started with the whole cloud, um, getting into uh, how we built our first OpenStack cloud into operations, and then some additional topics. We'll briefly talk about um, billing and metering. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, upgrades. Um, the good and bad things we learned by doing that. Uh, and last but not least, uh, if we uh, have time, uh, we'll briefly touch um, the, the topic of uh, a Ceph-based block storage. Um, so I'll try to, we'll try to leave some time for questions at the end. So, and um, um, yeah. Uh, a little bit about uh, ourselves. Um, so Frank is uh, actually the COO of the company. He, so he's running all the operations at ScaleUp. Uh, and he's been working on OpenStack since uh, 2012. Um, I myself, I'm actually the founder or the co-founder of the company. Um, the company was started in 1998, so quite a while ago. And I've been involved with OpenStack since 2011 uh, when I uh, went to, the, to my first uh, OpenStack Summit uh, in Santa Clara uh, back in 2011. Um, we have a third colleague who is not here today. I mean, one of us does need to work <laughs> at least a bit. Um, so Joe um, is, uh, is, well, the newest addition to our team, so he's uh, he's been working uh, on OpenStack since last fall. <clears throat> so a bit about ScaleUp to, to give you a perspective who we are and, and, and what we do. Um, so as I said, uh, my best friend, uh, uh, Gihan, and myself, we founded the company in 1998 in Germany. Um, and our first offering was plain web hosting. Back then, that was a big thing. Uh, nowadays, it's nothing anymore. Um, and we grew from there. Um, uh, headquarters are in uh, Hamburg, Germany. And we also have offices in Berlin. And we currently operate four uh, data center facilities, two in Hamburg and two in Berlin. Um, the reason for that is because we do have some customers who, who need uh, a way to, to run uh, redundant systems across multiple data centers. That's why we have two data centers in each city uh, to kind of enable uh, such a thing. Um, so um, I don't know. Maybe some of you were at the o OpenStack Summit in Austin last year. Uh, we did talk there as well. And uh, back then, our main topic was uh, how we actually built our cloud and how we got there. So I'll just briefly uh, reiterate that for, for all of you who haven't heard that uh, presentation. So we actually did get started um, with cloud computing back in 2009. Uh, around that time, um, we had uh, quite a few uh, customers and potential customers approach us as a company uh, wanting to have us run their uh, server infrastructures in a more flexible way. So um, back then, there were uh, a lot of those new uh, startups around all those web 2.0 topics, e-commerce companies. Um, all of them had great ideas, uh, small budgets. And they, they all wanted to have uh, a server platform which can 
scale if they, if they want to, but don't spend too much money on it. So we figured there, there needs to be a way uh, for us to, to, to help those customers more efficiently. So um, uh, back then, we already did uh, quite a bit of virtualization uh, of our infrastructure, but we, we wanted a more automated way to, uh, to help those customers. Um, so I actually stumbled upon uh, a company called 3Terra based out of California, um, and they had a, pro a product called AppLogic, which back then, back in 2009, was uh, probably one of the first uh, cloud computing platforms uh, on the market. Uh, so it was a small startup company. Um, there are, I, I think, like 10 or 15 people uh, back then, and they built a cloud platform uh, on top of uh, Zen as a virtualization layer and um, some other open, open source uh, software components, and actually um, built their own operating system, which you installed onto a couple of servers, and those servers kind of built a, a grid uh, of servers where you could e easily uh, provision uh, applications on top. So it actually had a very cool um, user interface, which more or less looked like Microsoft Visio, where you just uh, designed your application uh, on a canvas by connecting uh, all the dots, uh, you push the button, and then the software actually provisioned all those virtual machines, uh, interconnected the virtual machines with each other. Um, so it was a very uh, interesting platform. And we started uh, using this platform in production in 2010 after some extensive tests and actually launched uh, a cloud offering on top of that platform. Now. Uh, I probably would not, or we would probably not be here if uh, that all worked out. <laughs> uh, so uh, this was a, a proprietary software, a closed source platform. Um, that company got acquired at some point, and after that acquisition, um, they didn't really uh, develop the product any further, and it, it kind of lacked. Uh, like traction in the marketplace. Um, so we had to make a decision um, what to do next. And that kind of leads me uh, onto the topic of OpenStack, how we got started with OpenStack. So around 2012, we were still running this AppLogic-based cloud platform. Um, but we did have a few customers uh, requesting a uh, an S3-like storage platform from us. Um, so we looked around in the marketplace and actually decided to, uh, to use OpenStack Swift um, to, uh, to build such a platform uh, in order to offer cloud storage services uh, just as Amazon, Amazon does. Um, so we built uh, a Swift-only OpenStack cluster, um, which uh, whose only purpose it was to, to offer uh, object-based uh, storage service. Um, and that's actually how we got into OpenStack. And by I think it was by 2013, it was obvious that AppLogic was not going where we wanted it to go. And uh, that's when we decided to, um, to, to fully go into OpenStack. So. Um, to talk a bit about uh, how our uh, OpenStack setup actually is built. I don't know, do you want to take over yeah. from here, Frank? Yeah, OK. Um, uh, since uh, three years already, we're now running OpenStack Cloud. And it was in addition to the AppLogic Clouds we, we were running still when I began building it. Um, it took only three months to get it to production. And uh, from, uh, from the beginning, my, my, uh, I focused very much on uh, HA setup because I knew, uh, well, we do not have too, too many employees. And at least we have people who are able to work with OpenStack. 
So uh, HA is the, is, is, is the number one issue to, to have in mind when, when you build up this, this environment. Um, this is a, a picture we used last time. This was our initial setup. Uh, you see we had this uh, uh, open object storage swift uh, attached to it. Then I uh, had two controllers in a, a, a HA cluster set up. Uh, now I would tend to three controllers. Uh, we had this three server Galera cluster with uh, MongoDB for metering and everything running on it. Um, yeah, we had these two neutral nodes and uh, we have uh, Cinder and block storage was provided because we weren't able to uh, start with Ceph from, from the beginning as well. Uh, was provided by MSA, HP, Zons, uh, which were fed into the cloud by, by, by the Cinder cluster we had. Yeah, it's actually, this is a setup which basically still exists, which is in pr production since then. Um, it's not too big, we are a small company, and uh, this is not the only thing we have inside our por portfolio. We have data centers, we have uh, uh, customized server env environments uh, of uh, dedicated servers and stuff like this. So um, we are running now uh, 14 compute nodes inside that cluster, and uh, um, we have about 120 to 150 instances changing, running on, on, on this cloud. A huge amount of the servers, of these instances, is our own infrastructure. So I, I, I would guess we, uh, we uh, uh, save about 40 dedicated servers, 40 hardware, 40 pieces of metal just uh, by um, migrating all our own environment into the cloud. The rest is used by, by customers. And, uh, well. Um, yeah, so to, to, to briefly come back to, to uh, the slide before. So the initial um, setup was done, uh, built on uh, Ubuntu Trusty. Um, and one of the goals was to actually use existing uh, hardware infrastructure that we have. Um, that's one of the reasons why we integrated existing uh, storage arrays into this infrastructure. Now, um, we, we did see some issues with that over time. Uh, so, for example, uh, we did have a few uh, compute nodes integrated into the setup, uh, which had AMD CPUs um, next to Intel-based CPUs. And, um, I mean, in day-to-day in -day operations, was running fine, but uh, uh, we did run into trouble from, some, from time to time, so we did have issues migrating instances from there onto the Intel-based platform, and we also ran into some issues um, um, uh, during upgrading our OpenStack infrastructure. So we uh, recently, or last year, we decided to get away from this more heterogeneous uh, approach and make sure that we use only one, one vendor uh, when it comes to the servers. So we did have a mi mix of HP-based servers, Dell-based servers, and in the end, it, it, well, it was supposed to work, but we did have issues from time to time. To time so this is something that we've already changed. Um, Another thing that we are about to change is, uh, so we're building up a new uh, block storage environment based on Ceph, um, and we'll talk about this later. And currently, we use uh, multiple one gig uh, uh, connections uh, for this infrastructure, but this will also change uh, to a 10 gig based uh, environment. So coming to, uh, the topic of actually uh, keeping all of this running. So as you've, as you've seen um, or heard, uh, we're a small team. So we're yeah. essentially three people, and I can't really count myself, myself as a full member of the team because I'm not really involved in day-to-day in, in -day operations. Um, so how do we do that? And so, <laughs> yeah, before I begin, let me put first that uh, this is uh, this is an offering how we did it. We just explained how we did it. And uh, there 
are some decisions involved not to use or not to go this way or that way, which doesn't mean this way is bad or uh, our way is the best way to go. We just w want to find a way to describe how we uh, manage uh, to keep the cloud operating and uh, with, with very, very little downtime. I think we had one major issue in three years, which was uh, related to two compute nodes and the customers on those two compute nodes and then uh, lasting for about 10 hours. This was a major issue during an upgrade procedure. That was the time when I decided to get rid of the AMD CPUs because the server uh, in question were those two compute nodes. There was no problem with migration as long I, I could put, uh, I, I, I added those two servers to an own uh, aggregation group and from one to the other, migration was no problem, but uh, there were other things with, with, with the heart which, which I, I didn't want to, uh, yeah, d didn't want to care about any longer. So, why do we have a small team? Well, it's really hard to get OpenStack experts. It's either, even harder to, to get them over there in Germany. There aren't many. And if you get, they are really expensive. And the other thing is the really expensive OpenStack experts very often don't want to uh, do like the normal system administra administration work, which in a small company everybody has to be part of. So what to do? Um, in the end, the OpenStack cluster is just a bunch of servers. You have to just focus on that view for a moment. So a lot of the problems you have with your cluster are not OpenStack related problems, but really normal cluster trouble, which might be a, a wrecked interface, which might be a broken cable, which might be some database problems and stuff. But in most of the countries, uh, co companies, especially the smaller companies, uh, when there's any problem related to OpenStack, all the colleagues are screaming for the OpenStack uh, professionals to, to solve it. So maybe the, 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 they return it after a while to the database experts, to the networking experts, and because they found out, okay, it's not related to any, any OpenStack problem, it's just networking, a normal networking problem, it's just a normal database problem, but uh, uh, usually it's just, well, this small team is uh, uh, asked first, and uh, so how to get out of this dilemma? You have to consider yourself as your own customer. You have to build up escalation matrix like you do with your customers so that you have a really defined escalation whenever a problem occurs, who's to, who's to alert it first. And uh, only if, if, if they don't, if, if they're not able to solve the problem, then the OpenStack expert is himself responsible, is asked, uh, is alerted, not the other way around. This might, might, might sound very simple, but it's very often the case and, and very many uh, companies I, I, I was t talking to, it's exactly that problem. Um, how can I achieve this? Well, you, we use uh, CheckMK as a monitoring tool in our company, uh, which is uh, just a framework on top of uh, Nagio servers. And, uh, First of all, you do something very simple. You build up host groups, you build up service groups, and you have uh, certain uh, teams which are uh, responsible for this and that host group, for this and that service group. The next thing is uh, maybe use some business intelligence. In CheckMK, if you, if you set up business intelligence, you first define packs. PAC is just an expression, it's just a naming for a team of, of, of co-workers. And uh, the thing, 
if, you, if, you, if you're not uh, familiar with, with business intelligence, the thing is you don't get alerted because one single uh, process is not working, one single uh, server is uh, having trouble, but you get alerted whenever uh, a setup is not delivering or is not working uh, uh, correctly in total, which means you got, if you got three nodes run, hosting the controllers, when one of those nodes is not working, you don't get alerted because you know you got your HA set up, it's still, it, your OpenStack cloud is not in trouble. So why consider the OpenStack guys? They can, they can take, have a look next day maybe, but uh, first of all, it's, 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 it's just the, 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 the normal stuff. Take a look, what isn't working, whatever, wherever is the problem. This, yeah, well, this is of great help and anyhow. The, another very important thing is, is the database. A lot of problems I ran into, or we ran into, were database related. Uh, one example would be where well, we, we use as an HA setup as it's uh, described in many uh, tutorials or many, many documentaries of OpenStack. Just a Galera cluster, it's uh, beginning with three database servers, master master setup. And what we did is what we doing for many of our other customers, not cloud customers, we uh, had uh, balanced the uh, MySQL request by HA proxy with a decent uh, backend check configured inside HA proxy, but this, this, didn't, this didn't work too good. We, we had a lot of problems and we didn't understand what, what was happening, what was going on. So um, I think finally in Austin I talked to the Galera guys and they told me that uh, what I didn't know that uh, Keystone or uh, several pieces of uh, OpenStack soft is not um, performing too good with uh, uh, when, when, when the request, when the uh, um, queries get balanced to, 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 to different uh, backend nodes. Um, this, is, uh, not, this is not a fault of the HA setup, it's not a fault of Galera, but uh, um, for example, Keystone doesn't like getting connected to a different backend uh, every now and then. So uh, what we did is we changed the setup. We, uh, we installed max scale on the database cluster in HA setup with Corrosing Pacemaker. It's really easy. And then we did not split reads and writes as uh, so some, some colleagues uh, proposed would be best, but, but what I did is uh, I configured reconnections, which means every connection stays on the same back end, but in the end it balances pretty well, because uh, if you, you've got as many connections from one server to one back end as from the other server to, to another back end, but uh, the goal is all this uh, mysterious keystone is not working or um, yeah, error, notices like uh, no valid host found or your networking quota is, uh, is gone, all, th all this vanished. Okay. So uh, about logging, so another thing, um, I mean, yeah. might, might sound obvious, but nonetheless, uh, it's important to, uh, to have a single pane of glass uh, looking at uh, all, all those logs aggregated ag across your cluster. So what we do here is uh, we use Elk, an Elk cluster to do that. Um, do you want to go into more detail or is that? Yeah, it's really easy. It's a standard Elk cluster setup, but uh, I would uh, recommend that companies starting with their own cloud, that they really early start using a centralized log server, whatever kind of logging server. If you try to read logs on like six, seven, eight, nine different nodes from 
number X uh, different services, you get crazy really soon. And this is of great help, and yeah, you should start with this centralized logging. Kibana, uh, Logstash, and Elasticsearch is a great tool. It's, it's an easy setup, and it's uh, ho horizontally scalable, really easy. So I would recommend to start with this really early. So what to do when all hell breaks loose and <laughs> the cluster fails? Um, uh, that's certainly something which we uh, thought a lot about. I mean, having a small team, uh, you really need to make sure, and I, I guess we, we su succeeded in it, uh, that you know what to do when something goes wrong. Yeah. So uh, what, we, what we kind of did is that we, uh, so for all the other uh, uh, team members, or not members of the OpenStack team, but all the, our other ops guy, what we do is that we provide brief instructions in our, in our uh, wiki where we uh, document whatever we think is necessary. Um, and we, uh, we also try to, whenever there are issues or problems that, that we uh, come across, uh, we actually uh, communicate this back to the rest of the ops team at the company, even though they are not really involved in day-to-day -day operations of OpenStack. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we, uh, uh, we saw that it helps them to better understand what's going on. Um, and in the end, one of the most important things that uh, we kind of did is actually, uh, and, and we, we already talked about that, have an escalation matrix, as we call it, in place, where it's clear um, when certain things go wrong, who's getting the alarm, who's going to fix it, and when to involve the OpenStack team, uh, when, to, when to call for help. Um, so that's uh, one of the most important things. Yeah, and uh, to achieve this, well, we, we actually have a site which is uh, in German, was tun, wenn es brennt, which is what to do when hell breaks loose. So that all the colleagues can just focus on that side and just check, OK, OK, this and this is happening. And, uh, what I did is I, I, I wrote a lot of scripts with uh, tools to find out, for example, what's happening on your neutron cluster. What happened to us, and this was a learning out of an incident, was that uh, one neutron node was uh, broken down, and uh, not all of the L3 routers did realize that the, the node in question wasn't alive anymore. So uh, what, it's really easy to just change uh, the uh, um, um, agent responsible for the, for, for the router, router inside the database. But uh, if you don't know what to do, well, you can, you can search for ages uh, until you find the solution. So what I did is uh, just uh, a script which checks, OK, is this router on, the survive, on one of the surviving agents? And if not, just change the entry inside the database. Um, there's a lot of things. Well, I, I, I was uh, um, mentioning the bunch of servers. You see, a lot of my co colleagues are firm with uh, KVM uh, virtualization with all these libvirt tools and stuff, but they don't see the connection. They don't, at the first sight, see, well, this is just a hypervisor running KVM. This is just libvirt, and you can have all the description, all the necessary thing inside XML file. And uh, if you are really in trouble, and there's no way to fix it with OpenStack onboard tools, you can help your customer by migrating any instance to another still alive uh, hypervisor. And then afterwards, the expert can come and fix the OpenStack setup again. You will have a customer with a living application. You will 
he will not be able to manage it via the API or via the dashboard, but this is just, uh, well, of minor importance in that very moment. So what I try to train to my stuff is just see it as a bunch of KVM hypervisors. You're working with those a lot in your daytime work. And if it's that bad, forget about the OpenStack bit. We will care about the OpenStack bit afterwards. We will fix everything afterwards. You can fix everything afterwards. But you have to, to get this application running. And that's easy to achieve. OK, I think we have to <laughs> hurry up a bit. So upgrades is the next topic. Uh, so maybe we'll go a bit faster here. So um, the initial setup we did for Swift was based on IceHouse, um, which was kind of a standalone setup we did. Uh, then uh, we built a new uh, OpenStack cluster, uh, actually for the compute part. Um, and that we did uh, based on Juno back then. Um, and then at some point, we kind of integrated those two environments uh, into one. And last year, uh, we uh, upgraded uh, this environment from Juno onto Kilo. And to Liberty. And uh, then onto Liberty. Um, and we came across a few few issues, um, and you already mentioned. Yeah. So one of the issues was uh, networking related, which we never really discovered the, the true reason for yeah. it. It was two two hosts having issues in the cluster, and all the rest were fine. Um, uh, nonetheless, that upgrade went pretty smooth in the end. I mean, it um, went pretty smooth, yeah. Uh, most of the stuff uh, didn't have uh, downtime at all, um, which brings us to uh, to the next step. Uh, so now we are actually um, well in the process of uh, doing the next upgrades, and now we actually see see more problems here. So we want to upgrade to Newton. Um, uh, we already have test environments running on Newton, and they run fine. And maybe you want to elaborate a bit on, on, on the issues we see there. Um. Well, yeah. Um, one issue I was running to, into uh, in our test environment was, uh, um, well, logically, you have uh, Neutron and, and Nova running on at least the compute nodes in normal uh, setups, you would have them just running together on uh, uh, the controller. And I realized that I wasn't able, nor in one direction, first upgrade Nova and then upgrade Neutron, nor in the other direction, start with Neutron and then Nova. Because uh, if you have both fed by the same Python stack if you don't have a virtual environment for either the two. Um, there will be some dependencies upgraded which do not really cope with the elder version of the other program. I will try this again, maybe. Well, we have two uh, different ways to go, and I'm discussing now with my um, with the founder of my company, uh, if we, my, my, my wish, my aim is uh, I want to make the test environment our new production environment and migrate all the stuff over to the other environment. Except of the three database servers, um, the new, our test environment is uh, exactly the same than our pr production with uh, only two compute nodes. Um, the Newton servers, uh, Newton nodes are even better. Um, I'm, I've got this test environment running with Newton right now, which is really nice, really smooth. I like it a lot. I've integrated our newly built Ceph cluster into it with a 10 gig backend. And uh, we are providing all images, uh, all, BM, all uh, ephemeral, all uh, block storage, 
and uh, back up from, from, from the Ceph environment, and we're really satisfied with it. So uh, I'm thinking about uh, instead of upgrading the old production, just make the test environment the new production and make the old production our test environment. Because there are different things. It's not only upgrading the open stack uh, soft, but it's, uh, we, we are running all this on uh, Trusty, oh, Ubuntu Trusty, and we will need to, uh, or we will want to change it to uh, Xenile. And uh, so on top of the uh, upgrade procedure of uh, OpenStack from Liberty to Mitaka to uh, Newton, we will have to upgrade the service as well. And uh, the other thing is uh, we've got one customer who really extensively uses uh, the local as a server. Well, this was... Uh, uh, and the produ production environment, this is still version one, which is uh, not existing since Mitaka changed to version two. And uh, so there, uh, as far as I know, there is no way to migrate seamlessly from the uh, version one to the version two. This is, so, so I would have to find any way with a slight downtime for the customer to, to change this, to migrate this to version two. Um, so any, anyway, there will be some downtime, and I think that we can have it more controlled and more customer friendly if we do it by migrating. Our provider network mainly is based on uh, VLAN, and so it's, it's pretty easy to just interconnect the back ends of this or the provider networks of the old and the new cloud. And uh, um, the only thing is uh, uh, that we have to find a way to change the public IP address, the floating IP addresses, uh, because we will not be able to provide this from both sides at the same time. That's about it. <clears throat> yeah. Uh very quickly uh, billing metering because that sets always uh, the question. So we, uh, we actually have different things in place uh, and that's one recommendation if you only have a small team and not so many resources how to go about it. So we have some self-service based uh, offerings. They are fully automated into our billing system. Um, then for, um, the, we use Celometer uh, to generate reports. That's something that we, uh, we scripted. Uh, they generate reports uh, every month uh, for the cloud storage usage and the compute usage we actually extract out of Nova. Um, and our plan currently is to, uh, to change this because the Celometer data is just growing too much and generating too much uh, entries um, mm. uh, to migrate this uh, using Noki with Celometer. Uh, well, as, uh, yeah, as it was uh, with almost all the environments three years ago, we have uh, set up Celometer with a Mongo database backend, or most of the telemetry uh, setups are built like this, and uh, well, it's a common problem that uh, Celometer is uh, generating a lot of noise, that there are quite a bunch of, of entries inside the MongoDB, and very soon it's re getting really hard to uh, be able to uh, work properly with uh, uh, such, such, such an extended database. I already uh, have the whole Mongo stack running on, on the cloud itself, it's uh, nine servers, it's two shards with uh, three uh, config servers. Um, just a simple idea. Well, um, okay, we have the metering data running into the cloud itself. So what happens when the cloud doesn't run? So what do you want to meter when the cloud is not running? So it's okay to have it there. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, I have some, some, some tests uh, running with Gnocchi. This is really fine. 
but it didn't work out too good. Last time I, I tried in production was with uh, Kilo and uh, was not very successful with Kilo, but uh, with Liberty and Mitaka it's working much better. And that's what we're going to do. Yeah, so I guess we are out of time. <laughs> yeah. So we kind of have to unfortunately skip the Ceph based stuff and have some maybe a minute or two for questions. If not, you can approach us uh, afterwards anyway. So any questions? There's a question coming. Two questions. Um, have you had any security scares? And if so, how do you handle? And the second question, sort of a classic one. If you had to do it all over again, what would you do different, differently? So I guess the first question is easy to answer. No, we didn't have any nope. security risk issues. Uh, the second question, well, we started building the setup like almost four years ago. So a lot of stuff has changed around OpenStack. So yeah, maybe we would do it differently. But on the other hand, uh, we, like to, we like to really understand what we do. And uh, we kind of, the way we build our OpenStack is, is the way we approach other things as well. So maybe it wouldn't change as much. Yeah. I don't know. You... Yeah, the thing is, uh, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't come to this point. Um, I think if you're using, well, you can use DevStack for te testing, but if you're using um, in a small company, if you start build up a production cloud and you're using uh, the ready-made puppet modules or the Ansible stack or an anything, you really get to a working and satisfying result very, very, very fast. But it's hard to, to gain the knowledge you maybe need later on when things are not working the way they were planned. The other thing is learn, hard, learn it the hard way. And I think, uh, yeah, the gain in this is that you m might have some more understanding of what is uh, going on under the, hood, under the hood. And this helps you a lot in daily operational work. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <clears throat> There's one more. How large is your environment in terms of virtual machines and customers? Well, it's just, uh, I think it's just around 20 customers. It's very small. Um, the virtual machines, I don't know. Like... Virtual machines, it's, it's between 120, 150 right now, changing. And uh, we are, as I, as I said, our biggest, or maybe our second biggest customer. There's an, an one other customer who's really extensively using the cloud, and he's got uh, his own, he's, he's the one who, with all the low, balan low balances, and he's the one with, uh, he's got his own. Uh, he, has, he has images, or he has flavors with, I don't know, six, he's got his own images, he's got his of RAM own and... Kubernetes stack and all this. And uh, well, some, sometimes he's, he's the number one in instances, sometimes we are. But yeah, imagine, it's, uh, after all, it's 14 compute nodes and it's another 10, 12 servers. And uh, we, our company alone uh, uh, has, uh, doesn't need to, to uh, uh, run like 30, 40 bare metal servers because we have all this stuff on the cloud. So it's a win situation. The thing is, we, why are we here? We are here because we want to um, encourage small companies to try it, to give it a try, and to, yeah, just to dare using OpenStack, just to dare using cloud environments. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what we want to, to tell you guys. With that, we have to close, and I guess there's uh, beer in the marketplace also. <laughs>